Hi folks, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing something a little bit special for you because I'm going to be reviewing Dying of the Light by George R.R. R. Martin. Now, I actually picked this up and read this as a buddy reads with Todd the Librarian. So be sure to check the description below for a link to his review on his channel with his thoughts. We approached it in an interesting way because Todd has never read any George R.R. R. Martin before. Whereas I have read the Game of Thrones series, but I've read a couple of, of his other standalone books as well. So I think that gives us some interesting different uh, perspectives on this book. Unfortunately, from what I understand, Todd liked this book and I wouldn't say I didn't like it, but I didn't love it. It was okay. It was an okay sci-fi novel. Now this was actually George R.R. R. Martin's first ever novel and it was released in. Yeah, so this was first released in 1977. Todd's copy is actually one of the first or second editions, I believe. It's one of the early editions anyway. It's since been reissued as a sci-fi masterworks release. However, I have this weird copy here and one of the actual problems I had with this book was the actual the physical aesthetics of this book. I mean, if you look at the actual writing on the pages, it's pretty dense, you know. And actually that hampered my enjoyment. I also didn't like the cover much, but that's by the by. The main problem for me was the layout of the book and the fact that it was made so dense by the way it was printed. So Todd said to me at one point, he, when I started this book, Todd said to me, he was on page 75, and when I finished this book, he said he had about 200 pages to go. My copy of this is only 250 pages, so Todd's definitely got a different copy there. His is, I don't know how many pages, but it's more than mine anyway. And I think that has a knock-on effect. I mean. I know the actual physical object of the book shouldn't put you off from it, but when it is a really dense book and the pages are really thin so you feel like you're making no progress, and it is quite disheartening and it does have a knock-on effect to your enjoyment of the book, at least in my opinion. I guess I'll try and explain the storyline. So a few different blurby bits from Amazon. Three people bound together in love and hate are all that stand against annihilation for the inhabitants of the planet Warlorn. And there's a longer description of it here which I'll read as well, because it'll do a better job than I will. A whisper jewel from Gwen Delvano calls Dirk Tlarion across space and beyond the Tempter's Veil vale to Warlorn, a dying festival planet of rock and ice. Warlorn is slowly drifting through twilight to never-ending night. As the planet sinks into darkness, so its inhabitants face annihilation. Seven years ago, on Avalon, Gwen was Dirk's lover, his Guinevere. Now she wears the jade and silver bond of Jantony Riv Wolf High Iron Jade Vickery, a barbarian visionary, an outcast from his own people for his acts of violence. And Gars Janasek, Jan's Tane, his shield mate, is also bound to Gwen, in hatred. Dirk, a rogue and a wanderer, is called to be saviour of the three who are bonded together in love and hate, but in breaking their triangle he could lose all. By the way, that is really badly punctuated, so if I struggle to read that, that is why. <laughs> now, as you can probably tell from that blurb, there's a lot of kind of odd vocabulary here that you need to wrap your head around. It actually comes with a glossary of terms at the end, and you can go through and see what all of these different sci-fi terms mean. And I did read the glossary, I just didn't read it until after I read the book, and I also didn't like flick backwards and forwards to check the glossary because to be honest that does my head in when I read a book I mean I'm all for sci-fi authors being inventive with their world building and creating new races and stuff like this but I think you can do it in a way that you don't need an appendix so the way I see it is with Game of Thrones for example I hate to compare it to that series but come on that is his best known series so it's always going to happen in Game of Thrones, as much as it is complex in terms of the politics and the landscape and all of that stuff, you can still follow along. In fact, there's no need for a glossary of terms at the end of Game of Thrones. All there is is the stuff about the different houses and all the different characters and stuff, which I think is fair enough with a book like that. One of the good things about this sci-fi civilization is that it has its kind of entrenched cultural values there, and actually Bearing in mind this was published in 76 or whenever it was, it does ask some interesting questions about the role of women. And women are almost treated like property in this, and uh, you know, Martin highlights that as a bad thing. He also does dip into a lot of sort of fantasy staples, for example, there, there's lots of jewels in this book. Jewels as in D-U-E-L-S, not jewels as in J-E-W-E-L-S. So there's a lot of duels between two different people in this. There's a very complex honor system, which really I didn't give too much of a shit about. Another thing that was quite cool, especially in the early part of the book, there was a lot of talk about the importance of naming, and I actually took some photos of the book to remind myself of these quotes. So, names are very important everywhere, but the Cavalars know that truth better than most, 
A thing without a name has no substance. If it existed, it would have a name. And likewise, if you give a thing a name, somewhere, on some level, the thing named will exist, will come to be. There's another Kabbalah saying. So that was on page 28 for me, and then on page 30, you've got, give a thing a name and it will somehow come to be. Yes, you've just told us that. Give a thing a name and it will somehow come to be. All truth is in naming, and all lies as well, for nothing distorts like a false name can, a false name that changes the reality as well as the seeming. It's kind of like an intergalactic love story in terms of Dirk and this woman he calls Gwen or Jenny. They were both an item a long time ago. They had these items called Whisper Jewels, which they could send to each other as a kind of calling card saying, please come, I need help. And that's kind of what starts the story off. For me though, for this book, there was too much world building and not enough plot. It's the kind of book where it almost felt as though I was going into book six in a series or something. And it was just assumed that I knew a bunch of stuff about this you know, mythical world. And it does give you the sense that this world is huge and all encompassing. But equally, it's just hard to keep track of. And, you know, I like sci-fi, but I would have rather have read an Asimov or some Le Guin or something like that rather than this George R.R. R. Martin attempt, which it feels very derivative. And if I didn't know that this was his first book, I probably would still have guessed it. One thing that is nice, I opened it up on the train to start reading it. And I got to this page here. So I don't know if you can see that, it says to Megan, who is finally old enough to read my stuff. And then it's signed George R.R. R. Martin. And I've looked it up online and I'm no expert, but that is pretty much his signature. It's either his signature or somebody has gone to great lengths to fake it. Don't know who Megan is, but I bought this used online. So discovering that it was signed was a nice little, uh, nice little bonus. Basically, the dying of the light comes from the idea of this planet. It's kind of a festival planet because there was this once in a lifetime opportunity to basically bask in these meteorological conditions and this story is set after this festival when the planets have basically been abandoned. I think it's multiple planets, I don't know. That's how hard it was to follow. I didn't know whether they were going from one place to another on the same planet or whether they were going to a different planet and likewise all of the characters blur into one until at the end there was this big betrayal um, which is possibly a spoiler to mention that. Not only did I not see the betrayal coming because I wasn't really that invested in the characters, I didn't even notice it when it did happen. It was only when they talked about it afterwards that I was like, oh, that's what happened. I wondered there. And they started talking about this character whose name had been mentioned, but I don't recall actually seeing him throughout it. Now, part of this might be my problem because I kind of skim read it because, like I say, it just sort of dragged by a bit for me. It, it just, it wasn't up to George R.R. R. Martin's usual standard. And I'm not just talking about fantasy, although he is obviously a skilled fantasy writer, but even uh, as a horror writer, I think uh, he, he has better chops. And I'm gonna get two of his other books. So for me, as I said, I've read the a Song of Ice and Fire series, at least to the point we're at at the moment. And I have read two other George R.R. R. Martin books as well, which are uh, Fever Dream and then Windhaven, which he wrote with Lisa Tuttle. And for me, Dying of the Light was on nowhere near the same caliber as these two books. And these weren't necessarily perfect. Windhaven is great if you want a kind of a fantasy read. It's about these flyers and uh, basically it is kind of a political intrigue sort of thing, but it's very much fantasy about these people who are able to fly from island to island, follows one of their flyers throughout the course of their life. And uh, this, although it doesn't look much like it, this is the kind of book I would have enjoyed when I was maybe 13, 14. It's got YA vibes, but it's not really YA. And to be honest, if you are going to read a George R.R. R. Martin book that is not part of the a Song of Ice and Fire series, for me so far, it's got to be Fever Dream. And Fever Dream is interesting because it's kind of like historical fiction, but with vampires in like 19th century America going up and down the Louisiana Delta, I think it is. The Mississippi Delta. Did I make the Louisiana Delta up? I don't know, I'm not American. And what's cool about this is this harks back to the vampires of uh, Dracula, you know, the, not the glittery vampires, the other ones. And Todd, if you're watching this, which I assume you are, if you enjoy George R.R. R. Martin and you don't want to read Game of Thrones, read Fever Dream next. It's like Salem's Lot mixed with... It's like Salem's Lot except taking place on like barges in the Mississippi in the 1800s and it's freaking badass. This is a very good book. Comparing these two, or even this to any of the other George R.R. R. Martin books I've read. It just wasn't on the same scale. It just read like any, you know, hack sci-fi writer. It wasn't, for me, it wasn't on the same level as the great sci-fi writers. It wasn't 
uh, mainstream enough to kind of cross over or anything like that. So I can only really understand why you would really like this if you're somebody like Todd who's really into, you know, you know, hardcore sci-fi, I guess. I don't know, it's just a bit slow. I was disappointed, I was looking forward to it. One of the cool things, I was trying to explain this earlier and I got sidetracked. One of the big suns in this system around the planets where they're at is called Fat Satan. What a name for a sun. Great job. I just wasn't much of a fan of this book, I'm afraid. I'm going to go to rating time now. For the purpose of this review, why not? Three and a half stars out of five. It was okay. It was nothing special. I feel bad about saying it because this is my first buddy read and I, I was looking forward to this and thought I was going to enjoy it and I was left feeling disappointed, unfortunately. It's not going to put me off George R.R. R. Martin. It's going to make me a little bit hesitant before I read any more sci-fi by George R.R. R. Martin. He's very much cutting his teeth on this book and I do think it, that it tells. However, Todd might not agree with me, so make sure you look below into the description box to get the link to the video on Todd's channel where he's going to talk about this book. And uh, yeah, I mean, it was a fun buddy read and I'll be interested to see what Todd made of it. But for me, just just wasn't the one, unfortunately. Sorry about that. So anyway, thanks a lot for watching. Don't forget to hit subscribe. There's someone at the door. I can tell you exactly what this parcel is that's just arrived as well, but we'll do this in another video because this is a very exciting unboxing, I believe. Anyway, thanks a lot for watching. Don't forget to hit subscribe. Let me know what you thought about this review with a comment, whether you're going to be checking this book out, whether you've read it already, whether you've read any other George R.R. R. Martin books, whether you've read any good sci-fi and you think I should check it out. Let me know with a comment, leave a like, etc. Hit subscribe for more bookish videos and I will see you soon. Bye.